earlier. As I said on Monday, just looking at the number of cases and the number of countries affected does not tell the full story. Of the 118 cases reported globally in 114 countries, more than 90% of cases are in just four countries. And two of those, China and the Republic of Korea, have significantly declining epidemics. 81 countries have not reported any cases, and 57 countries have reported 10 cases or less. We cannot, this, we cannot say this loudly enough, or clearly enough, or often enough. All countries can still change the course of this pandemic. If countries detect, test, treat, isolate, trace, and mobilize their people in the response, those with a handful of cases can prevent those cases becoming clusters and those clusters becoming community transmission. Even those countries with community transmission or larger clusters can turn the tide on this virus. Several countries have demonstrated that this virus can be suppressed and controlled. The challenge for many countries who are now dealing with large clusters or community transmission is not whether they can do the same, it's whether they will. Some countries are struggling with a lack of capacity. Some countries are struggling with a lack of resources. Some countries are struggling with a lack of resolve. We're grateful for the measures being taken in Iran, Italy, and the Republic of Korea to slow the virus and control their epidemics. We know that these measures are taking a heavy toll on societies and economies, such just as they did in China. All countries must strike a fine balance between protecting health, minimizing economic and social disruption, and respecting human rights. WHO's mandate is public health, but we're working with many partners across all actors to mitigate the social and economic consequences of this pandemic. This is not just a public health crisis. It's a crisis that will touch every sector. So every sector and every individual must be involved in the fight. I have said from the beginning that countries must take a whole of government, all of society approach, built around a comprehensive strategy to prevent infections, save lives, and minimize impact. Let me summarize it in four key areas. First, prepare and be ready. Second, detect, protect, and treat. Third, reduce transmission. And fourth, innovate and learn. I remind all countries that we're calling on you to activate and scale up your emergency response mechanisms. Communicate with your people about the risks and how they can protect themselves. This is everybody's business. Find, isolate, test, and treat every case and trace every contact. Ready your hospitals, protect and train your health workers, and let's all look out for each other because we need each other. There has been so much attention on one word, and you know that. Let me give you some other words that matter much more 
and that are much more actionable. These are prevention, preparedness, public health, political leadership, and most of all, people. We're in this together to do the right things with calm. We're in this together to do the right things with calm and protect the citizens of the world. It's doable. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director General. Before we start with questions, I'll remind the uh, journalist uh, uh, joining us uh, through uh, dialing in. It's uh, star nine on your keypad. For those who are watching us on Zoom, <laughs> for those uh, who are joining us on Zoom, it's uh, clicking on raise hands. I will ask really uh, journalists to ask only one question uh, so we can get as many as possible and we will start as we always do here in the room with a couple of questions. Uh, Musa, please, if you can come down and uh, use the mic, please. Uh, at the stade de, de la propagation de, uh, de ces virus dans certains pays, est-ce que vous recommandez uh, la fermeture de, de certaines institutions comme les écoles uh, ou bien la frontière, les aéroports? So the question is, at this stage uh, of the epidemic, uh, what's your uh, recommendation when it comes to uh, closing institutions such as schools? Uh, and what about uh, closing uh, borders and airports? And finally, uh, what's the situation in Iran? Um, the decision to close schools and, and, and to do lockdowns or shut down particular parts of a country uh, are entirely based on a country's own risk assessment and and uh, it's a mix of measures for example in some situations schools have been closed like in china whereas in singapore schools weren't closed uh, the governments make decisions based on a mixture of issues the risk the likely impact of the measure the acceptability of the measure uh, the length of time the measure has to be left in place uh, certainly uh, reducing or increasing social distance can certainly slow down the spread of disease but it is a poor substitute uh, in in a countries with lower numbers of cases, social distancing does not have the same immediate impact as contact tracing, isolation of contacts, isolation of cases, quarantine of contacts, because that means you're chasing the virus. When people move towards broader-based social distancing measures, it effectively accepts that the chains of transmission are no longer visible. So what you want to do is separate everybody because you don't know who's infected. It's a much more cost-effective measure at the beginning to identify those who were infected or potentially infected and isolate them from the community. When you lose track of the outbreak, then you have to social, you have to create social distance between everybody because you don't know who's infected. It is a poor substitute for aggressive public health action at the beginning, but it may be the only option when you've effectively lost sight of the virus. Uh, so it really does depend on the stage of the epidemic, and it sometimes depends on social acceptability. There is no point in reality in governments implementing measures that are entirely unacceptable within a local context, because it can create more tension and more problems than it solves. So again, without overdoing it, we would not, other than offer countries advice on any specific situation, but we don't have a specific rule regarding uh, social distancing or school closures, etc. With regards to Iran, our team is still on the ground. We have uh, part of our international team has already left Iran, but a team will remain on the ground with Iranian authorities. Clearly, the situation in Iran is still very serious. Uh, there's still a very high number of deaths. There's a high number of uh, sick people. And while the number of cases and the intensity of surveillance has increased, we would like to see that increase even, for, uh, even further. Uh, and we would like to see more support to the clinical care of sick people in Iran, both within Iran, certainly, but with our support and the support of the rest of the international community. Thank you very much. So just to uh, let you know, uh, we uh, informed you that there will be a press conference by our regional office tomorrow, uh, our regional office for Eastern Mediterranean. Now that, that press conference has been postponed for Monday. We will send the uh, details on that. We go for the next question here. Uh, Chen, please. Okay. So, uh, one question. One question, please. 
uh, what is the decision making um, uh, mechanism within WHO concerning the uh, declaration of pandemic? So, and uh, are the member states involved in the procedure? Thank you. There is no, uh, uh, the DG has said this many times, there is no formal process and, and, and pandemics as such are not declared. It's not like a public health emergency of international concern in which there's a body of international law where WHO engages through the emergency committee, through the national focal points in making that decision. This is a characterization or a description of a situation. And the DG has said it is not a change in what we do. It is not a, a, a trigger for anything other than more aggressive, more intensive action. So in that sense, uh, uh, it, it is not and would never be declared as such. The second uh, point is that it is taken very seriously because we understand the implication of the word. And the Director General has gone through a very detailed set of internal and external consultation with experts, with his regional directors, with many of us over long hours uh, in, in assessing uh, the use of the word as a as a as a characterization the likely uh, benefits potentially of galvanizing uh, the world to fight, uh, but also, the, as the DG has outlined, the dangers of using a word if people use it as an excuse to give up or if people see it as something that grows fear. So there's a lot of internal consideration has been given. The Director General has listened to people from across and throughout and very deep into our organization. This has not been a corporate decision in the sense of made by only the seniors in this house. He has listened to everybody uh, and has come to a, a determination based on, on a broad-based input of expert advice both internally and externally in order to determine this. But there is no mathematical formula, there is no algorithm. Uh, this is a characterization of the current description of the outbreak uh, around the world and a call to action uh, and a call not to give up. But the DG may wish to comment himself on, on his, uh, his thought process. I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank can I, you. Can I, say, can I add what I think is more important here is how we have been working with all of our member states. We have been working across all of the countries, affected countries and not, about assessing the situation over time from day one. And we've been sitting up here telling you that, that there are many characteristics that are really important for us to better understand that relate to transmission and how is this virus circulating, what is the extent of infection, who is most at risk for infection. And with regards to severity, who is dying from this disease? How are people dying? And what can we do for, to prevent people from dying? And thirdly, the impact. And I think what we have been doing from day one is gathering evidence, learning from each other, learning from what China experienced, how they handled the situation, learning from what Korea is doing and Japan is doing and Singapore is doing, and we can go on and on and on. And every day we have these assessments. Every day we're looking at the evidence. Um, and, and that's what's really critical. Our guidance, our recommendations from very early on, our first guidance was published, I believe it was on the 10th of January. Um, and that is an assessment of based on what we were, we were seeing in the evidence and what we expected to happen. We are constantly revising that and that doesn't change and it hasn't changed what we've been recommending to all governments and all people. Thank you very much. Let's take one more question uh, from here. Let's start with a lady that we've seen for the first time here. If you can introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Nina Piper Brown, I'm from Iran International. I replaced the idea of my colleague. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, you said you're grateful about the measures Iran made uh, to counter the virus. Uh, would you please elaborate on that and tell us more about the team came back from Iran? What do you think is needed right now inside Iran? Because we're hearing that there has been lack of med medical supplies and equipment inside of Iran because of the sanctions. Yeah, yeah. There, are the, the um, 
the team and, and the DG spoke to this previously. What he particularly referred to was the fact that there was now an all of government approach. There was national leadership. There was buy-in and, and, and coordination between the national and the sub-national leadership, and there was a coherent strategy. And the fact that that strategy was launched as a as a single plan, and there's that people are gathering around that as a single strategy. Uh, surveillance has certainly been enhanced in terms of the case detection and the, the amount of testing. And in order to support that, we're working in conjunction with the Chinese government, uh, China brought in over 20,000 tests. We brought in over 100,000 tests into Iran over nearly two weeks ago. The days blend into one another at this point. Um, and equally, uh, both uh, China and ourselves brought in personal protective equipment. We've made it clear that those supplies are in are very, very short, and we're struggling to find other supplies externally. We do, as I said previously, have thanked the United Arab Emirates for their facilitation of the process, and again, we're working with uh, with countries, including China, on re resupplying our logistics hub in, in Dubai. Um, so um, uh, we've sent a further uh, 100,000, 40,000 tests into Iran over the last 24 hours again to increase the intensity of testing. Um, and in the end, uh, you know, all of this is uh, drawing millions of dollars uh, of resources in order to continue to supply that. Uh, right now in Iran, there is a shortage of ventilators, there is a shortage of oxygen, um, and clearly, and you've seen this in Italy and you've seen this in other countries. What happens at this stage in, in, in an epidemic that's intense, that's generating a lot of severe cases? Uh, as of this morning in Italy, there were nearly 900 people in intensive care. That requires a huge health worker commitment. Mm -hmm. To take care of intensive, really unwell people can often require two to three medical staff at one time, all in protective gear for hours and hours. Number one, they use up a lot of protective gear. Number two, they become exhausted very quickly. And our concern for our colleagues in Iran and in Italy right now is actually the caseload, the demand on the health workers, and the dangers that come with fatigue and potentially shortages of PPE. So we all must move quickly. While some countries are affected more than others, uh, and yes, we can get into the game of whether governments are doing enough or not enough, or whether things were better planned or should be planned. The fact is, right now, in countries, we have frontline health workers who need our help. We have hospitals who need our support. We have people who need our care, and we need to focus on getting our frontline health workers the equipment, supplies, and, and, and training they need to do a good job. So I think we need to, in that sense now, all focus on the job at hand. We can work out after the fact, uh, could we have done it better, or who's at fault, or who's to blame. We really need to focus on the word that the Director General has been using for weeks, solidarity, getting the job done. We need to move now. Iran and Italy are in the front line now. They're suffering, but I guarantee you other countries will be in that situation very soon. Uh, so we all need to show that solidarity for each other. We're focused on practical support to Iran. Uh, and, and, and we will continue to provide that and working with international partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Just two lines I would like to add. Um, uh, from the reports we got from our experts who were on the ground, uh, we know that Iran is doing its best, all it can. That's number one. And that's what I appreciated. And second, uh, they need lots of supplies. And as Mike said, we have tried to support as much as we can, but there is still a shortage. And we're trying to mobilize more support for, for Iran. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll try to take a few questions from uh, journalists online, and uh, uh, I will remind how you can ask question. It's uh, star nine for those online and those dialing in, and it's a clicking, raising hand. Uh, so let's try. Let's start with uh, Helen Bransfeld. Helen, can you hear us? Can you hear us? I can. Thank you very much for taking my question. I'm wondering. I'm you are getting additional information from China. In particular, I'm interested in finding out if you've had any word about the serology study that they were meant to be doing. I would have thought that they would have had data by now. 
Thanks, Helen, for that question. Um, one of the things that we are we are hoping for uh, in the coming weeks are results from serologic surveys. So as you all know, um, molecular tests were developed very quickly, serologic assays are being developed very quickly, and they're in use in a number of countries. Um, we understand that there are sero surveys that have begun in several countries, including in China. Um, we do not yet have the results from those. But what we're hoping for, what the results we are expecting in the coming weeks will have to do with better understanding the extent of infection in the general population, um, hopefully by age structure. Uh, we've seen the protocol uh, that will be used there, and it is an age-stratified general population sero survey. So it will take some time. Um, we do need to give them the time to run these epi investigations, these zero epi investigations. Um, we are uh, pressuring them, and not only China, all countries to carry out these types of investigations, share their results with us so that we could better understand how transmission is occurring. But it will take, it will take some time. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let's try uh, Isabel from uh, FA. Spanish News Agency. Isabel, can you hear us? Hello, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yes, thank you. Is regarding the rapid increase in cases in Spain in the last 48 hours, and I would like to know if you consider that the measures imposed by the government are enough or it needs to be more aggressive at this stage to contain the spread of the virus? Um, I think uh, all countries now need to take a very close look at what are their objectives in responding uh, to the epidemic in their own country. Are they uh, accepting that the disease can now spread completely in an uncontrolled fashion to all corners of their country and they're going to focus on just trying to keep the health system moving forward and trying to keep the health system from collapsing? That's what's known as mitigation and the focus is on uh, effectively supporting the health system to reduce fatality. Uh, we've had uh, lots of people talking about containment versus mitigation. The Director General has spoken since the very beginning of this outbreak uh, about a comprehensive approach to this epidemic, focused on containment where there's an opportunity to contain, containment on isolating the virus within the chains of transmission that exist, uh, and preparing the health system to reduce the impact should the disease uh, escape that uh, control or escape that containment, and that is what's known as mitigation. Uh, it's very important that people, I think, understand that the DG statement today it's not an escape clause to mitigation. It's not about saying, OK, the, now we have a description of pandemic, we all move to mitigation. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is not the time for countries uh, to move towards mitigation only, uh, unless and until they are not in a position to affect the course of the epidemic and try and stop this uh, organism. The difficulty is that if you do not try and suppress this uh, virus, it can overwhelm your health system. So you, there have to be very strong efforts made to suppress infection, to, inter, to push the infection back, because at the very least it will take the pressure, it will allow and flatten the curve and allow your health system to remain uh, in control um, and, and, um, and, and, and uh, achieve some success in, in reducing case fatality. So from that perspective I think uh, it's very important that we use our words very carefully from here on in. With regard to Spain, um, Spain has a uh, number of cases has uh, have accelerated uh, very, very quickly over the last couple of days, as have France, as has Norway, as has Denmark, and has, as have a number of European countries. So it's very important that countries in the European Union and in Western Europe really do look at what their current control strategy is for this disease and to assess whether the efforts they're taking are good enough in terms of suppressing transmission uh, and, uh, and pushing back the virus and then obviously preparing their health systems to cope with the cases that do occur. All countries need to review their strategies right now. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I would be happy to add uh, to that. Uh, I had a very good uh, discussion with His Excellency Pr Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez of Spain uh, two days ago, and I was, um, in, you know, very much impressed by his commitment. And Spain is using the whole of government and whole of uh, society approach. 
And uh, we believe that uh, that political leadership is really key. And we discussed about uh, that uh, approach mobilizing the whole society and uh, making the response uh, everybody's uh, responsibility. And uh, we hope to see um, progress in, in, Spain, in Spain too. Uh, the Prime Minister took uh, the initiative to, to call WHO and to, to consult, and that's a very uh, important measure, actually, indicator uh, of leadership. And he told me that he's prepared to do everything uh, to stop uh, this outbreak. Uh, then on containment and mitigation, again, uh, we don't want um, anyone to make a mistake. Uh, when we, um, um, uh, you know, say the situation now is pandemic, we are not saying that the world should move from containment to mitigation. We are not. Uh, we believe, as WHO, uh, that the comprehensive or blended approach should continue. And in that comprehensive and blended approach, Containment should be the major pillar. As Mike said, the numbers themselves actually speak why uh, we are saying this. 81 countries have no cases, so they should do everything to prevent from importing any case. They shouldn't give any ground for this virus to, to set foot in their country. And then there are 57 countries who have reported less than 10 cases, 10 or less cases. They can cut it from the bud. 81 plus 57 is 138 cases. And 90% of the total number of cases we have, the total 118 cases globally, Four kind countries reported 90% of it. 90% of the 118,000. So it will be a mistake to abandon the containment strategy. Of course, the rest of the countries will be between the four countries who have re reported more than 90% and those who have reported 10 cases or less. So we believe that the best way forward is the blended comprehensive approach which puts containment as a major pillar. And we have also given examples. Many countries have already shown that when you have cases still can be contained, however big the number of cases is. And we are convinced that although this is the first coronavirus to be labeled as pandemic proportion, but at the same time, we believe that it will be the first also to be able to be contained or controlled. That's what we are saying. It can be because we have seen... You've been listening in there to the World Health Organization formally declaring the coronavirus a pandemic. Hi, everyone. I'm Rena Nine, and thank you very much for joining us. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back at the top of the hour.
every Sunday night at 8 on CBSN. Stop the noise. My moral compass, my politics, and my worldview comes from the internet. And turn the world. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? Right side up. Who here believes in evolution? Chaos meets clarity in eye-opening original documentaries anywhere you want to see them. Sunday nights at 8, only on CBSN. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony every morning on CBS This Morning. Bottom line, it's going to get worse. State of the outbreak, the World Health Organization declares a coronavirus a pandemic. As the number of confirmed cases jumps in the U.S., officials race for a solution, while public facilities feel the pressure to shut down. Learning his fate, former Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein sentenced to 23 years in jail after being convicted on sex charges. Biden wins big. The former vice president expands his delegate lead over Bernie Sanders after last night's contest. Is the Vermont senator feeling a different kind of burn? CBSN continues now. Hi, everyone. I'm Rena Nine, and thank you for joining us. The coronavirus outbreak has entered a new phase. The World Health Organization has officially declared it a pandemic after more than 120,000 people worldwide have been infected. More than 1,000 cases have been reported inside the United States, with at least 32 deaths nationwide. 40 states, including Washington, D.C., have confirmed cases. 15 states are currently under a state of emergency. Schools, universities across the country have closed in an effort to contain the outbreak. More than 1,200 schools are reportedly closed today, impacting more than 850,000 students. Earlier today, one of the country's top health officials, Dr. Anthony Fauci, issued a stark warning to the House Oversight Committee. I can say we will see more cases and things will get worse than they are right now. How much worse we'll get will depend on our ability to do two things, to contain the influx of in people who are infected coming from the outside and the ability to contain and mitigate within our own country. Bottom line, it's going to get worse. But first, we want to take you live to Burlington, Vermont, where Senator Bernie Sanders is holding a news conference last after a disappointing show in last night's primaries. Good night for our campaign from a delegate point of view. We lost in the largest state up for grabs yesterday, the state of Michigan. We lost in Mississippi, Missouri, and Idaho. On the other hand, we won in North Dakota, and we lead the vote count in the state of Washington, the second largest state contested yesterday with 